Okay. Recording. Cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, point number one, I created a role in Discord for the CAD CAD study group. Um, I tried to tag everyone that was here last week. Uh, I think I got everyone. I missed Santiago, but he let me know. Um, so <clears throat> I'm just going to use that. And honestly, you guys can use it too. Uh, if you want to give information or if you're giving information to the study group or whatever, um, <clears throat> I think you're able to use it like permission wise. So, um, but yeah, just kind of as an active a list of active members of the study group, uh, so that we can connect and communicate, um, and get notifications. I'll personally be just sending out, um, reminders, uh, for the sessions, just, uh, easy and then some information after the sessions too, um, with like links and stuff uh, from the session. So if you see a notification from that, that's what it's for. If you'd like to be removed, also let me know. <laughs> uh, maybe it's annoying for some people, so cool. Um, and then I, um, the last thing I just wanna to touch on quick um, is more about the uh, concept of the study group and some questions um, or comments around topics like related to the duration of the study group and commitment overall, like time commitment of the study group and some prereqs. I think maybe I wasn't super um, clear on some of that stuff last week. And um, so I wanted to kind of like just talk about it real quick for one minute um, and um, basically give the answer that there isn't really a defined duration or commitment that's required or prerequisites um, for the study group. And a lot of that is unknown um, as we're just kind of like working through all of this uh, learning about CAD CAD and trying to understand what our learning goals is, are and what process we should take to get there. Um, we're like kind of all in that process um, right now, including myself. I'm not an expert on um, CAD CAD uh, as a tool or CAD CAD 1.0 or um, generalized framework or anything. So I'm also kind of learning along the way. And <clears throat> um, yeah, so it, overall, like the path of this study group is flexible. But we basically are creating a space where we can that we can use for exploring CAD CAD, exploring the new concepts in 1.0, and creating trying to create learning journeys for ourselves, um, and so create some structure to help ourselves and each other learn. Um, and with the help of the peers that are also in the same experience and. Um, the mentors that are uh, offering some time to join, like Tyler and probably some some other block science engineers um, in the coming weeks as well. So um, maybe not a, a super <laughs> helpful answer, but uh, I think just in general, it's, it's going to be a flexible experience. And um, we're all kind of finding the way together, um, including myself personally. So, but I'm excited to be here. I think Tyler has um, is going to be able to offer some really great context on uh, these con on these concepts, and once we learn them, then we'll get a better idea of where we're going next and like what models we might want to try building or yeah, how to get there. Um, so yeah, I guess that's that. Um, are there any questions from last week about uh, any of the content um, that was covered? or I guess not the content that was covered, more about the structure of the program, um, <clears throat> since it is fluid. I uh, just wanted to like see if anybody's super confused or wanted to make a comment or a question. Cool. Um, did anyone get a chance to check out the one-stop shop? I don't know if, if you did, uh, hopefully it was helpful. If you didn't, um, maybe just go check that out. It's linked in the channel above. Um, and yeah, that just has all the links that we talked about last week. Um, so I'm kind of collecting, I'm, I'm collecting the links there. You guys can also all save links there, um, as kind of the home base for the program. So hopefully that helps organize things a little bit too. Cool. Um, yeah, then uh, with that, I guess we will get started on uh, picking up from where we were last week. Um, 
with Tyler walking through some of the crash course concepts and yeah. Cool. Uh, thanks, Peter. Yeah, so we're basically just going to do a, a revisit of the material that we went over last week. I know that, um, you know, we, we hammered out quite a bit over those two hours, but not all of it stuck. Um, and so I wanted to have a chance um, to sort of explore some of these concepts that were more nebulous or abstract in nature that, that didn't really uh, get grokked fully. I wanted you guys to have a chance to sort of ask questions. And uh, and I, I really want to make sure that everybody understands these concepts, um, you know, pretty deeply before we start moving on uh, to other things. One other thing I'd like to say, too, is that I don't have experience, uh, not much anyway, with modeling. So we're, we're over time going to venture more and more into areas where I don't have a lot of uh, experience myself, even though I am working on the CAD CAD 1.0 uh, rewrite, um, modeling is not something that I've done a ton of. Um, so this study group is every bit um, as much for me as it, as it is for you guys. So definitely want to make sure that we're treating this like a conversation, a discussion, um, you know, there's a bunch of people in this group right now. Let's let's treat this like a just a group, um, you know, exploration of these concepts. If you have questions, don't hesitate. Ask. Um, let's let's get that all in the in the open so that we can talk about it. And then uh, I think maybe in the second half of this call or, or next week, we'll start moving more into um, the processes of identifying systems and breaking them down um, into into more logical pieces um everyone okay with that does that make sense yes okay um yeah so let's let's go ahead and revisit let me i'm just going to share my screen real quick and i'll just pull up the crash course that we did uh last week let me know if you guys can see this should be able to see my browser hopefully yeah, we can got see. it okay yep let me let me know if voice or video get choppy because I know we don't have the best Discord connection right now. Uh, Latency is kind of high, so uh, if it starts getting choppy, you need me to repeat something. Speak up. Um, all right. So just as a refresher, we're gonna go over blocks, points, spaces, um, dimensions. So. Uh, as, as we learned last week, everything sort of focuses around the idea of dimensions, dimensions being uh, these data points that we're interested in sort of identifying and tracking over time throughout a system. Um, one thing that I think might be useful as far as thinking of, of a collection of um, dimensions is to sort of think of um, the the dimensions all together as a sort of signal, right? With a lot of different attributes or, or properties. Um, and that signal is something that's flowing throughout the system. And if it's a closed loop system, you're gonna get that feedback mechanism where it sort of comes back to the beginning or, and, and um, goes through the process again. Um, but dimensions are really at the heart of this entire thing. It is the information that we are watching and manipulating potentially updating and changing and augmenting um, as it flows through the system. Uh, at its core, dimensions are really just a name to make it human readable for us, some sort of label, and a data type. And spaces are a collection of these dimensions put together in whatever way we need. Now, something that I think I didn't do a very good job explaining last week was sort of the why you would need to have spaces. And I think that that sort of uh, fell through the cracks or didn't get explained fully because my example was very, very contrived. I used, if you guys remember, I used that um, rock, paper, scissors example in, in code. And, and also here in the crash course document, I use some pretty contrived examples as well, very simplistic examples here. Um, but I, I think, you know, revisiting that um, so that hopefully we can get a few more people who understand spaces are perhaps heavy 
uh, when you're dealing with very, very simple um, models. But where they become useful is when you start having um, large amounts of data that, that you need to track and ensure are a part of your um, signal, if you will, right? The information object that's flowing from one block to the next, it's easier uh, if you sort of define the space or the boundaries or the, the, the shape of all of this information once, and then you can just sort of uh, implicitly have that sense of security that this information exists in the correct format and you never really have to worry about it. Otherwise, every single block would have to do its own checks, right? Where it looks at the state space uh, and, and says, okay, I need this piece of information and this piece of information in order to perform my operation, whatever that is. Um, but rather than having to do these long lists of if else, sort of um, constructs, you can literally just sort of implicitly understand that all the information that block needs is going to be there because a point could not be passed into that block unless it satisfied a space. So it's just sort of like preloading um, your your uh, type safety and, and other things like that ahead of time. Like I said, kind of heavy for some of these models that we're using as examples, like rock, paper, scissors. But as, as our systems become more complex in nature, you're going to start to see that spaces really are the preferred way to do that. Um, there's also some, some added benefit, too, in, in uh, having your dimensions available via spaces. Um, it allows you to do mathematical operations on spaces to get subspaces and new spaces, which are... Um, uh, composites of more than one space, right? Um, in in the math language, we we um, call that a uh, a product. Um, but yeah, essentially, what you're doing here by having everything in spaces is you're you're accessing an API that allows you to take a space, which is a collection of a bunch of dimensions, and you can you know combine it very easily um, using math operators in Python to combine one or more space um, and and there's also api for grabbing just a subspace um, of of an existing space those are very 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 useful things that you guys will be doing uh, a lot as you start developing and modeling more and more complex um, systems any questions about that before we sort of revisit blocks and points Yeah, I just want to have a quick question on the data types. Can you just give an yeah. example of some of those data types that are existing in these spaces? Yeah, so for a dimension, um, and this the API is going to be changing here a, a, a little bit. So I don't want you to take this as, as law in 1.0. This API is kind of a moving target. Um, but the the premise is that as you set up your space and you define the, the data that's in it, you, you essentially say, here's my label for this piece of information that I want, and here's the actual type, right? And what this ensures is that when actual information from your state space is, is flowing through your, your system or through your model, um, you can actually make some, some assumptions here. Um, you know that the point uh, that is being passed into your block, if it has Alice age as a property, um, that that is going to be an integer because the point couldn't have been created if Alice age, for example, had been a string, right? So there's this type checking um, that's sort of um, implicit that comes for free um, just by way of having types attached to the dimensions themselves. Um, and, and this sort of piggybacks off of the, the points API that we have where you can't even instantiate a new point unless all of the data that is in that point satisfies the requirement of a, of a particular space, right? So you define your space as sort of the schema, if you will, all your dimensions and all of their types. And then when you create a point, you say, I'm creating a point of this space type and here's all of the values for it, the keys and their values. But they have to match that schema that was set up in the space. Does, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to know more if I could find the, if there was like a list of those it's, types. Or... Yeah. Yeah. So from a GDS, from a CAD CAD formal spec, it's whatever types come native with the language that you're developing this in. In the in the reference implementation, we're doing this in Python. So all of the basic Python built-in types will be there. But you oh. also have the ability to create classes in your own types and then use those as your dimensions. In fact, I would I would think that maybe 50% of the time, that's actually what you're gonna be doing. You're gonna be creating these more complex types, right? Because ints and strings are useful, but I, I think in in really more interesting models, you're, you're gonna tend to sort of have these composite types that are a little more complex in nature. And for that, you could maybe take something from NumPy, for example, and subclass it into a subtype, or, or you could just create your own your own classes and then use those as as the data type for your dimension. Um, but uh, the point is, is that you're you're on the space you're going to define a piece of information that you care about and impose some sort of restriction on what that data can be. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. That that takes us with uh, through dimensions and spaces. Let's go ahead and talk more a, a little bit about blocks again. I just want to make sure that this. Have a question. Oh, go ahead. The difference between states and spaces. Okay, so the space is, itself is sort of the schema, and your state space is. I mean, I'm I, perhaps conflating the terms a little bit here. Um, your state is the current information um, that adheres to a particular space. So you can sort of think of your state as the state of the world in this particular moment. But it, but in the GDS or in the CAD CAD system, you know at any given point, if you, that state object, uh, what we call points, that state object has to adhere to some sort of uh, associated space that was defined ahead of time. Now, what you'll end up doing in a complex system or a complex model is you're gonna have multiple spaces describing what the state of the world should look like at various points in the in the system. And so, you know, sometimes uh, it's gonna completely change, but sometimes it's just gonna be uh, the old state space, but with a few extra things added. Sometimes it's gonna be a subspace. The idea here is that you're, your space describes what the state will need to look like. But but if you think blockchain, then you would have states of spaces. You wouldn't have many spaces. You would have states of spaces. So are you when you say spaces, does that mean sort of like multi complicated, uh, not related to blockchain, just any business system? None of yeah, none of this is is blockchain. This is completely okay. independent even if the even if the words are the same um blocks in this particular case when we're talking about blocks we're talking about blocks taken from block diagrams and from um systems engineering these are not blocks like blockchain blocks. okay yeah yep um, so let's Tyler? oh go ahead can we yep. access points from the past or does a block need to store that i say that again can we access uh, points from the past? So, I mean, if I understand correctly, a point basically yeah. represents its current state. But if we need to stay from, say, five points back, can we yeah. access it? Yeah, that's that's absolutely going to be possible. We don't currently have the ability for that in CAD CAD 1.0, but not because we've developed it without, uh, but because we're not to the point yet where we've implemented um, you know, uh, some of the, the layers that come on top of blocks, like putting blocks together, creating trajectories and being able to reach back in time and grab, you know, state as it existed five time steps ago. That That is definitely something that will be supported. Yes, we just don't currently have it implemented yet. Would that be supported on the, the local per block level or is that a global state supported, what's global support thing? I can't say I can't say for certain where you're going to access it, uh, where that's going to come from. My hunch is that, well, your blocks need to have access to it. How blocks get access to it, that API has yet to be determined. Cool. Yes. Yeah. 
All right. So let's talk about blocks. Um, if, if there's there, another question. Yeah, there was there was one question in the space or in the um, Discord. Uh, Rohan, did you want to ask it? I can read it out for you. If not. Um, well, can you please just read it out because I yeah. can't raise my voice. Yeah, no problem. Um, so the question is, what relation does the idea of spaces have here here have with mathematical construct of spaces? So Minkowski space, Hilbert space, etc. I don't know what those are, but um, I, I know for a fact that spaces, blocks, points, dimensions, these come from mathematical um, from the from the math world. So now there are particular flavors of math as you've identified there i don't know what the particulars of those are so i can't tell you if it's a direct you know um, um parallel here or if if it's a perfect parallel but uh we didn't j just make up any of these terms these come from um systems engineering which is heavily uh and control theory which is heavily based on on the math right so spaces in this particular case is uh is exactly what what you would expect if you were dealing with with the math in fact, if you look at, let me see if I can can pull it up. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop a document in Discord. We'll do this. I'll drop it in the study group. Let me just drop this document for you guys. <clears throat> Desktop. So this is. And I don't know if anyone else has like um, high level math backgrounds that might also know, um, but if there's relationships, but. Feel free to chime in if you do. Yeah. Yep. So if you look at the GDS notation and definitions in that PDF, um, this is a, a document that was created by by Zargam and and uh, Jamshid Shurish, um of Block Science. But they've they've essentially identified you know state state trajectories, input space, state sp space, that sort of thing. Um, but it's all from the math perspective, right? So for those of you who are coming from the math background, look that over and you're going to, I'm willing to bet you're going to start seeing some very familiar um, concepts here. Like I said, we haven't invented anything new here. I don't want you to think that we've just come up with terms on our own. Now, whether or not I use them correctly, that's that's on me. But the, the terms themselves uh, come from, from uh, well-established fields already and concepts. So, okay, any other questions? Hey, Kojak, right. could could you mute if you are there? Yeah, we got, got the dog. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and revisit blocks. So blocks are kind of where all of the meat is. If you ask me, this is where all of the fun stuff happens. Um, this is where we start using spaces, um, and and this is the point at which points themselves actually um, start changing and being created, right? Um, so the the general idea here is that you've got a you've got a block which represents a process or an update in your state space. It's going to take some information. It's going to transform it somehow. Now, what does that information look like as it comes into the block? That's where we utilize uh, the concept of a space. If we've identified a space with a bunch of dimensions, we can attach that space as sort of a, a filter or a, a restriction on the information coming into the block. Now, in the, in the block, we call that incoming space the one that filters information or or um, requires information to look a certain way before it comes in, we call that a domain. Okay. Um, as the information is leaving the block, once it's been updated or transformed or whatever you want to call it, we call that the codomain. Okay. Um, but the premise here is is fairly simple. You have a block. Um, you create a domain or specify a domain, which is just a space. You specify a codomain, which is just a space. Now, when you invoke the block, when you actually try passing real state information into the block, the point that gets passed into the block has to conform, has to satisfy the um, the space that was set as the the domain, 
has to satisfy that shape, that structure. Okay. The information that comes out, which will be another point or maybe a, a set of points, is you can technically do that. But let's keep it simple and just say a single point is, is output from the block. You know that this point that gets created or generated from the, the incoming point, it has to satisfy the space that was defined as the codomain. Okay. I used an example last week of the pizza oven, and I know for, for Chris Frazier, who I believe is on this call, that made a couple of things click for him in his head. Um, but I wanted to sort of revisit that because he, he actually came up with a better analogy, still using the pizza oven. But um, the pizza oven uh, analogy um, works really well here if, if we say that the oven itself is the block that transforms the incoming pizza and, and produces the outgoing pizza. But the space, the domain space, would be all of the ingredients and stuff that you require your pizza to have um just uncooked right um all of the ingredients that have to be there in order for it to be allowed into the oven then the oven performs its transformation which in this case not a perfect example of something that's super useful but we we cook the ingredients and then we say that in order for it to come out of the pizza oven in order for it to leave the block it has to be a cooked pizza the cooked pizza is your codomain space it's what says, okay, we still need pepperonis, we still need tomatoes, olives, whatever, but it has to be the cooked variety of that, the, the, cook, the cooked version of that. Uh, um, so hopefully that sort of solidifies um, the I have utility. A on that. Yeah. In terms of the heat of the oven, how would we define that considering it within it? What, what would that be a part of? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, the heat so does it depends. Contribute to yeah. It, it really depends on, on like, if you want that to be a configurable, right? So depending on what it is you're modeling, um, and this is actually something I want to talk more about later on, um, but this concept of, like, what is it you're modeling and why? What is it that, what are the questions that you want answered? Are you just observing for the sake of observing and better understanding something? Um, you know, maybe the relationships between two interacting parts, or are there actual things where you want to say, I want to know the impact of this particular variable on the overall outcome, right? And so if your pizza temperature, the oven temperature, was a variable that you wanted configured, you will actually have, there's there's a third part of the block, or maybe a fourth part, um, that I, I don't really talk about here, but it's your param space. It is the configurable parts. It's that sort of external configuration that the block can refer to in order to perform its operation, whatever that operation or that transformation is. In this particular case, in the pizza example, the oven is the block and its param space would be the the speed, or uh, yeah, the speed that the conveyor belt is moving and the temperature maybe. Those could be like things that come from the param space. And you could modify those in between simulations and see how that affects the overall outcome of the pizza, right? Um, does that answer your question, like where that would come from or how that gets included? That's actually when you when you create the block, there's actually a parameter dedicated for your param space, which includes all of those configurable. Yes, that's exactly what I was. It makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. All right. So now that we kind of understand um, blocks. Oh, there's one more thing here, too, that I want to talk about, which is it, which is dynamics. You're going to hear us talk about this sometimes. Um, actually, probably more often than not going forward, you're going to be dealing with dynamics rather than just a simple block. But when you're dealing with complex systems, what you're really talking about is a system that is composed of systems, which itself uh, themselves are probably composed of, excuse me, subsystems, right? Being able to take a block and connect it to another block and then take that two block system and treat it like a single block in a new system, that sort of composive, uh, composability, that um, recursive property there is what we call a, a dynamic. When you're, when you're able to create a block, connect it to some other blocks, create a system, and then take that system as a whole and treat it as just a block in a new system, right? That hierarchical relationship there is what we refer to as dynamics. And uh, the way that we've developed blocks in 1.0 makes this very easy for us to define blocks and then use them to build 
arbitrarily complex systems from them. So something to, to be thinking about. Okay, so last, this is sort of the thing that ties it all together, the point. Point is our state space at any given uh, point in time. Now, I like to think of points as just a JSON object. In our Python implementation, it's a dictionary object. It's a, it's a little bit more than that, but it's essentially just a dictionary where we have keys and we have values. Now, if you remember here, this is an example of like a space which represented our input space or our domain space where we say that they're, uh, the point that comes into this block would need to have three different pieces of information. They have to be called this, Alice age, Bob age, Charlie age, and whatever their values, they need to be integers. Easy enough. Then we say our codomain is, uh, is a space that says there needs to be one property or one attribute, I guess, um, called average age and its value, whatever it is, has to be a float. And then when we create our our um, our block and we we assign it the incoming space or the domain and the outgoing space or the codomain to use that block, we actually have to instantiate a point or get it from the execution of another block. But we need to come up with a point that can be fed into the block. And here you can see an example of just like a JSON-like object. But here we're passing in uh, an object or a point that has three properties, Alice age, Bob age, Charlie age, with some integers. This is exactly what is required based on this schema definition up here for the domain space. And here, the output of the block gave us a new point. It only has one property, which is average age, and it has a float. It's not super useful, it's not super interesting, but what you can see here is that we took a point, we passed it into the block, and the block gave us a new point outgoing. Now, something that I want you guys to understand is that the, the type of point that goes into a block does not have to be the same as the type coming out of it, right? That's actually kind of the whole point of the block is to take uh, some existing point and update it or change it or modify it. Now, we're not actually changing, modifying everything's um, immutable. We're creating a whole new point out of it. But um, but yeah, hopefully this concept is is coming through here. The only other thing that that maybe is worth revisiting too is that when you create the block itself, you define a function for it. That function, here's an example of one, is what takes the incoming point. You can see here we have a parameter called point. We look at that point for these three things. We divide it by three, and then we create a new point um, that satisfies our outgoing. Uh, space, I guess this one right here, right? Um, with our average. But this function right here is defined as a function on the block at the time that you create the block. So when you create a block, there's four things that you'll need. There's the domain, which is a space that all incoming points have to satisfy. There's your codomain, which is a space which the outgoing point would have to satisfy. There's your function, which actually takes the uh, incoming point and does something to it to produce the outgoing point. And then optionally, you have your param space, which is just the way for the block to get some of these sort of external data points um, that it might need in order to do its job. In this particular case, we don't use param space in this example. We don't use it for anything, but referring back to that pizza oven, you could see how having things like some of these control variables available through the param space would be useful. And, uh, and every block can have its own parameters fed to it. Does that make sense? Are we still, is there any part of these four concepts that people are, are still not sure about? Can I just ask, um, so it's more like, and just thinking of from analogies, because when we've been exploring CAD-CAD, we've been doing these stock and flow models. So I just wanted to sort of think around how we could translate that to stock and flow. And I just want to throw something at you. Like, is the domain like the, it's like the initial state, then this codomain would be the updated state. The function yeah. is the policy. And yeah. these parameter spaces are sort of your, uh, 
the data libraries that you're pulling from. Is that is that? Yeah. Is that yeah, that's that's absolutely there? right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Now, yeah. Now, keep in mind, I'm I'm not an expert at at the modeling aspect. So when it comes to taking these stock and flow diagrams, these causal loop diagrams, these block diagrams, these are all different ways to sort of represent systems. Um, and uh, the best way to take those and and sort of those diagrams and map them into CAD CAD, I'm still a little fuzzy on myself. One, because I'm not, I just haven't done it a lot. But two. CAD CAD 1.0 is not completely done. The API is is still yet to be set in stone for a lot of these things. So I don't know exactly how it would how it would work. But based on what you just asked, we definitely have enough to describe what you're talking about just using these four things, right? Dimension, spaces, blocks, and points. Um, same thing with block diagrams and causal loop diagrams. I think um, for the most part, just using these four primitives in CAD CAD 1.0, you should be able to describe um, at least very loosely um, any sort of, of causal loop or block diagram you throw at it. Because really what those diagrams are illustrating are, are actors that are interacting with each other. There's decision making, and then there's the sort of like relationship between them and, and it and the, the flow of information through these systems. Um, when I was talking to Z yesterday about, you know, best practices for taking systems and breaking them down. One thing that he said in that conversation that really stuck out to me was, for some people, the best way to think about information flowing through these systems is to just think of it as a signal, right? <clears throat> um, so for, for those of you who, who are familiar with like control theory, you have a signal coming in and there's some objective um, that you're trying to get out of it. You you want to do something to that signal or you want to get a particular signal out the, out the backside of it, right? And your system is what controls, regulates, or, or modifies the incoming signal to, to get that desired outcome. Um, but you'll see that a lot in block diagrams, especially because block diagrams are used very heavily in control systems. Um, that seems to be like the preferred uh, diagramming type. So um yeah any other questions about these four things yeah go for it would it be right to say that a block is like a procedure while point is like a model in programming concept um yes i would say that that's fair yeah so I can say yes What's that? Can you just repeat that, please? Yeah, so I think what she was asking is, is the block sort of your procedure or your function, and the point just constant data? Data that would, doesn't, doesn't change. Would, would the point not be the state? Well, it, w it would, but you could think of it as unchanging state, which I assume is what was being meant by constant. You don't actually modify the data in a point, and, and your point is your your state space. Yes, you don't modify it. You just take it, use that information to generate a new point, which is the next step in the space in the uh, stage. Yeah, which would be a new a new block or or maybe a dynamic or something like that, right? Um, but yeah, once once a point is generated, you don't mess with it. And I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, but I assume that was what you were getting at with the con. Um, this is immutable data. What's the rationale for changing the taxonomy from blockchain when we are talking token engineering here? Um, we're not changing it. This GDS as a as a framework um, existed long before blockchains did. We are basically just implementing um, in a, in a I guess more user friendly way. Uh, GDS as a framework so that people can use it to model things. Again, I would try and detach this from blockchains. The You can model anything with GDS. Biological systems, control systems. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I get that. I, I also followed the CAT CAT training earlier, but I was, I'm mm -hmm. trying to relate to the fact that you have uh, in a blockchain, if it's token engineering, um, tokens sort of connect to 
blockchain systems and you have um, blocks processed sequentially. And I know that CatCat can do all sorts of things from a dynamic perspective, but it was it was tricky to understand what's the relationship between how to model things dynamically and then how to um, adapt them to an Ethereum virtual machine or a sequential processing uh, model, which is what tokens are sort of subject to. So, so here you are. I, I'm, I, I mean, I think I get it, but I, I, it's slightly confusing that you are using blocks in a different terminology and points, and not using states in the way that states are used in token engineering. So, so should we just disregard the fact that uh, token engineering is something completely different? CatCat 1.0 is something that is just complex uh, system dynamics modeling. So yeah. forget everything about blockchains, because that that's sort of where yeah. I, I, I came from. This from a blockchain perspective, uh, mm-hmm. and before that, I came from a sort of Monte Carlo perspective. Um, mm-hmm. But but so, so I'm just sort of what what's the context? Is this is complex system dynamics? Forget everything yeah. you ever learned about token engineering, uh, and think how to model system complexity. That's what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, I would say that that's probably a safe bet. Um, okay. You know, you're at, at some point you're going to have to revisit that that knowledge that you have, and you're going to have to map it to this. And I think that there's going to be a little bit of um, pause that's going to need to be, you know, that you're going to need to do before you start translating um, blockchain centric systems to CAD CAD because a lot of the language is being reused here, right, in a different way or a different context. But I think but, if but, you but can, if, I, can I can I mean I, I yeah. actually to be honest I thought one of the great things about CatCat was that it actually allowed you to look at partial state updates so that you could actually see and foresee and understand what happens as a an epoch goes through the cycle and mm-hmm. you're basically now sort of disregarding all that um, and I'm sort of wondering why because that was actually a pretty unique feature of Cat cat. Uh, it's probably still there, but you're not really emphasizing it. You're generalizing cat cat. Yeah. Yeah. No, your blocks would your blocks would basically be your P subs. But c- composites of blocks would act as your state update. The overall state update that needs to be performed, you can use blocks to break it down into partial state updates. Okay. Does that make sense? It's all about yeah. composability. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, blocks just address it at many okay. different levels. And Mandy, I think can can you type out your question because you're coming? Yeah, audio is pretty choppy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would just have a. Uh, uh, I guess sort of just a comment on the token, forgetting token engineering when thinking about CAD CAD. Um, I think that I'm, from my perspective, I'm not trying to use token engineering to understand CAD CAD or these concepts, but I'm using CAD CAD to help understand token engineering or that that's sort of like how it works in my head. Um, I don't know if that helps with what, how you're thinking about it, Hendrik, but um, yeah. Yeah. No. 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 I, I mean, I, uh, I I just thought it was actually the first time I saw a a dynamical uh, stochastic simulation engine that allowed you to adapt to states uh, where you could otherwise just take any sort of uh, crystal ball, Monte Carlo, something tool to do mm-hmm. stochastic simulation. Here, you're actually allowed to, through the old CatCat to do sort of agent-based bottom-up simulation modeling, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and 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 then see, okay, so how does that actually work through a, a blockchain model? And and of course, that's an application, but here, so I, I just needed to understand that we're now lifting it to sort of a generalizing CatCat 1.0 is, is, is as it was also presented in the CatCat Edu, uh, a generalized uh, sophisticated system dynamics tool but I thought that since it was promoted by token engineering, um, that it was actually relevant to tokens. And it is, but 
uh, it's being presented in a sort of yeah. sort of higher level state here, mm -hmm. which I was, I was trying to relate to. That's all. Totally. Yep. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> I think making that bridge, you know, connecting the two things, more generalized GDS type understanding in theory to the context of token engineering is something that will happen over time. But I can't really start to make that connection until people understand the GDS primitives, right? The CAD CAD primitives. Once people sort of understand the building blocks of CAD CAD and how they're used, when they're used, why they're used, then we can start to say, okay, let's take this understanding and apply it to a very specific type of economic modeling through token engineering. Yep, got it. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Um, cool. I All right. Actually, hopefully a quick one, but um, mm -hmm. the concept of time steps, is that would like a time step be a space and then the like each new time step would be its own point kind of thing. Is that, is it worth like yeah. trying to apply time steps in this context yet? It's, it's probably a little bit too early okay. because I think there's a lot of like fuzziness to exactly how that look and work, but yes, every time step there's, there's no way around this. This I can, I can say for certain, um, a time step would have to go, uh, would have to start with a point and end up with a new. So, mm -hmm. um, now, what, what you could sort of think of is, uh, let's say that you have uh, a time step. Um, uh, what's a way to put this? Let's say that you have like an overall block that needs to do something. Its, it's end result is take this input, produce this output. But um, that occurs over time, 10 time steps. What you would probably do is that block itself would be a composite of uh, one or more sub blocks, if you will. Mm -hmm. And each of those sub blocks acts at the time step yep. level, right? Um, yeah, like I said, the API for that is exactly how that we're right on the cusp of starting to implement the actual execution level um, API, but we haven't we haven't implemented it yet. Cool. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay. So in general, it's. Um like time is going to be like explicitly passed in through the blocks versus like sort of an ambient notion? That's a good question. I I don't know. And this, this I think speaks more to my just inexperience with modeling as a whole. Um, but I, yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't think that it would be explicit in that you need to be like you say minute you know um 1251 1252 but i do think that time steps in particular you would have to keep track of um and i'm not sure if that happens at the block level although i suspect that it does because of the way that we're building blocks as sort of this foundational um you know building block that can be put together with a bunch of other blocks and then that collection of blocks being treated as a as a single block to build a new system. I, I feel like the blocks themselves would have to keep track of individual time steps. Yeah. But I don't know it's a little fuzzy in my head. I don't know because I haven't done it even with CAD CAD legacy uh very much. And I certainly don't know the internals of legacy. And that might get a bit memory heavy, especially if you have blocks that need to look back into the past. Yeah, so there's different ways of of handling that. There's there's definitely um, computational costs for doing some of this stuff, memory costs um, as well. One thing that I do want to say is that with 1.0, um, I'm actually probably going to stop referring to it as that. I'm going to start just calling it the reference implementation. Uh, one thing that I want everyone to understand is reference implementation primary objective is being educational. It's uh, being documentation in code form, right? Um, we want it, the reference implementation to be what people use to learn CAD CAD and learn how to model. It won't necessarily be the implementation that you use to run 
really large, complex, useful models. For that, there is a Julia version that's being developed alongside the reference implementation that uh, performance and, and um, better utilization of resources is top priority for that. But the API should be almost identical. So in theory, you should be able to construct a, a model um, in the reference implementation and adapt it to the uh, version with very minimal effort. Um, but the reference implementation is not going to be something that is performant. We want it to be easy to use and easy to understand. Um, you, you should be able to run everything on it, but it just won't be performant. All right. Um, not really sure where to go from here. What are people interested in uh, in sort of talking about next? There's um, not much more in the API side that I could talk about with the reference implementation yet. Um, but I'm interested to see if like where people are anticipating um, utilizing this information. Um, one thing that I think would be useful to to start talking about as a group is the process of taking a system that we're interested in modeling and sort of breaking it down into its its smaller pieces. Um, let me see if I can actually show you. I'm going to link. Yeah. Uh, dimension. Yeah, it was the very first thing that I talked about, but I don't. Yeah, but I could totally go over it again. So, in, all good, all good. Yeah. So dimensions at their most basic form is nothing more than like a human readable label that explains to you as a modeler what the information is supposed to represent and then some sort of data type that uh that we can use to make assertions later on right so if you have something like if if age for example is something that you want to keep track of then you would probably call your dimension age and you would give it an appropriate data type where you say ages should always be an integer right if you had a property that you were looking to keep track of or some information that we were looking to keep track of called name well you probably could could say that name should always be a string right so you're 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 saying this is the data i'm interested in and this is the type of data it is and you use dimensions um to create spaces that's all they're they're used for when you when you define a space you basically say here's all of the information that i'm interested in operating over and uh and here's the data types for all of that that way, when you pass in a point, your block already knows that the data is going to be there in the form that it needs in order to perform its operation, uh, because the space and the point being constructed together um, sort of um, ensure that. Right. Cool. Awesome. I had a feeling it was mentioned. <laughs> yeah. And and like I said, um, in this crash course thing, if you guys just, I'm gonna drop this back in the channel too. Um, here. So just as a refresher, you guys can go there. Um, that'll be updated, you know, continually over the next month as the API uh, continues to get fleshed out, fleshed out. And I'll I'll be adding in more and more examples to sort of explain some of these concepts because right now I just have the one. Um, that's in here, and it, could, it it doesn't fully describe the relationships between these things, or at least maybe not adequately. Um, so, but yeah, definitely look at that for just some real basic information on all four of those things. And then uh, here, if you guys look, I, I have a GitHub repo here where I started to break down just kind of conceptually um, my rock, paper, scissors system. Um, this is something that I think would be useful for people to start doing for a number of systems 
to get used to the process of identifying the system in which they want to model and then really breaking it down into pieces that you understand which ones are necessary for the model, um, ha- what their relationships are with each other, and then also starting to identify what are the what are the sort of like control variables that that you want to be able to configure as well. Um, in my own personal experience, this is much harder than you might think, um, and I think that the only way people are going to get really good at this process and being able to jump into the code and start developing things right away is is practice. We're going to have to do this process over and over and over for a number of different types of um, systems before we can sort of um, just intuitively jump into the code and understand how best to construct them. Right. Can you, um, can you share the can you share the the GitHub link, please? Yeah. Yeah. Let me drop Thanks. that in here too. Yeah, and like Peter said, the the one stop shop is is exactly right. Use that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the resources what we want. So, yeah. Um, this this RPS this rock paper scissors is a very contrived example. It doesn't really do anything. It there's no system really as far as like a closed loop system. Um, if I were to add agent behavior where it was a little more complex and there was some decision making that maybe went into um, making a rock, paper, scissors choice um, based on past performance, then the the system itself would be a little bit more interesting to look at. And I am going to update it to become that over time. But right now, this document describes it in a single uh, block system where two choices are made ahead of time, and then we essentially compare the results and output a winner. That's it. Um, but I think when it comes to breaking down systems into these logical sort of uh, categories or whatever you want to call them, um, I, I think one of the best ways to attack the problem problem is to try and generalize your system as a single block and then sort of snowflake from there right where you go in and you say okay what is my system's input what is the output from the highest level and then sort of reason about it maybe fill out this document with that sort of architecture in mind and then go in and take it and and break it down into uh, the next level where you've got maybe two or three blocks that now interact with each other the end result is still the same thing. Your input produces some sort of output, but now it happens across three different blocks instead of one. Um, even the most complex um, systems, as far as I can tell, uh, generally, well, I don't know if I should make that statement yet. Uh, Zargum seems to think that, you know, you're talking a dozen or less um, blocks should be able to be constructed to produce even the most complex system. And I think that that's especially true with the reference implementation because of the way that blocks have been designed. You should be able to sort of reuse um, blocks and, and spaces and, and dynamics, um, I'm sorry, dimensions, over and over and over. So you define it once and then it's just how do you... Um, so yeah, let's, let's kind of open this up for, is, does anyone have any ideas about systems that maybe they're interested in modeling or questions that they have about the particular application of CAD CAD given a a specific uh, system. I'd like to ask you know two questions. Is my voice clear? Yep. Yep, I got you. Yeah. One thing is that. Uh, isn't it true that uh, both GDS and CADCAD are indifferent to the underlying, say, whether it's a blockchain or whatever it is, basically CADCAD is a, uh, a simulation platform. And GDS yes. is a, uh, you know, GDS is a very generalized uh, way, I mean, approach to. Yes, for the it's, that's absolutely correct and how we should be thinking about it. 
Yeah. CAD uh, CAD is a specific take on GDS, or rather, I would say it's GDS and code form. GDS isn't even new. It's not something Block Science or or the CAD CAD organization created. It is a concept that's been used to describe and to reason about complex and dynamical systems just as a whole, no matter what they're actually, you know, what those systems are, whether it's biological, mechanical systems, whatever, it doesn't matter. GDS describes it. CAD CAD is GDS and code so that you can you can actually do something programmatically with it. So the last element is, is, is actually the coding aspect. So the what? The last aspect, I mean, once, yeah. one, once you, uh, the uh, model is actually conceptualized or visualized or whatever in GDS and then defined in CAD CAD, then comes yeah. the coding part. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But the, the thing is, is we don't want people to feel like they have to be programming experts either. CAD CAD is meant to provide you with a framework or a tool set of primitives that you put together in ways that make sense for your model, whatever it is that you're trying to that you're trying to model. But but if we've done our job correctly, the programming should be fairly light in terms of constructing the architecture of the system itself. And the only thing that you really need to, to program would be the functions of your blocks, where you actually say, okay, I, I have some incoming data or I have an incoming state that I need to access in order to perform some sort of logic and then create the outgoing point or the outgoing state. Um, those blocks will need to have a little bit of programming. Same thing like in like you had the partial state update blocks. That's kind of where you put everything. Um, this is, is effectively the same thing. And your blocks you'll program, but for the rest of your model, it should just be very basic instantiation of a handful of objects and then um you know putting them together linking them together but yeah the very first step is it for any model is going to be um conceptualizing what it is how, how this model is going to work and i think in order to do that you have to first understand the system which you're modeling um, because your model is not going to be a one-to-one -one representation of the real-world system, you're going to you're going to want to uh, pull some stuff out and and keep it very focused, I guess you could. Um, yeah. The, so, yeah. The second thing which I wanted to ask is that GDS being such a generalized framework, uh -huh. uh, if if it has to be implemented, I mean, if it has to be uh, visualized for CAD CAD, then it has to be done in a, in a particular way. Correct, and uh, because uh, what is the uh, is there any a, any sort of guidelines for that? Because GDS is an extremely generalized framework, and and CAD CAD is a kind of a repository for for uh, actual modeling. I yeah, I I see what you're saying, but we are trying to build CAD CAD so that if you've if you've done if you've broken down a system into its GDS parts, for lack of a better term, like you're going to see that it's the same terms being used. GDS talks about state interaction through blocks and points, and dimensions, and and all of those concepts are implemented in CAD CAD. So it shouldn't be. It, it the only difference should be that GDS. Maybe you can think of that as like the mathematical rep representation of the system, whereas CAD CAD is the Python, the code version of it. But the I, but the concepts and the primitives are still there, and you still use them in the exact same way. So what you're basically saying is that if you define it in GDS, it it makes the CAD CAD implementation far more simpler. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Basically, okay. I'm I'm trying to model. Uh, a tiny I mean, economy, I mean, assume it's it's a village. So even a village has got three levels, the micro, the meso, and the macro. So uh, I've just started, I mean, for the sake, I mean, this is a kind of a very real kind of a stuff which I'm attempting. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I mean, it's, it's not the typical, Kind of problem which uh, 
you people are basically involved in i'm a, i'm an economist a financial engineer so uh-huh. i'll i look i mean i think gds is you know gender is enough to even tackle these type of issues you should be able to i mean the whole the whole point of gds is that it's abstract enough that you can use it to describe any um dynamical or complex system how exactly that works for economic models i i'm not i can't really provide any insights that i've done it enough myself and even the stuff i've done has been so super simplistic i don't think it's even worth mentioning in most cases but having said that we i i understand that this is a token engineering um study group right yes we're learning about cad cad but it's all under the premise that some be doing token engineering with this information um and in the coming weeks we're going to have some or some model of block science um that have extensive um experience building out models for economic and they will be able to provide all the sort of nuance and insight mm-hmm. into that process stuff i just i can't really speak. yeah um Oh, sorry, it kind of cut out for me for one second. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, all good, all good. I was I was done talking. Nice, cool. So as we think about as we think about things like bonding curves and liquidity pools, is that something we could look at from a system decomposition perspective at this point, or something we should wait on? Um, yeah, those are not systems that. I know anything about, but I think that we could, yeah, absolutely start breaking them down um, into their smaller pieces. I I think like in my rock, paper, scissors example, I'm talking about not a mechanic, but a system as a whole. So I think if you're talking about something like, well, I guess, I guess you could, with like a bonding curve, I think you could, you could still approach it with these, um, questions or categories in mind and start breaking it down and then once you've got it into these pieces i feel like you should be able to then go ahead and say okay what does that look like in cad cad using the primitives that we've talked about dimensions spaces how many blocks to do you know this thing um so yeah we could do that we'd probably need to be driven by somebody who better understands those particular mechanics um yeah but yeah we could do that and and so I, I've here now two uh, examples of like of systems that people are interested in modeling, and I mean I think that's probably for me personally I think that's where I'm gonna take it to like picking a system and then basically trying to represent it in the concepts the like CatCat 1.0 concepts um, and like as a first step to doing that because I can't do it already because I've never done it before. I would probably use Tyler's <clears throat> template that he's showing us or maybe other um, system mapping tools like the block diagrams, um, which I also don't really know much about, but I could planning to like do some research on. Um, and yeah, and then kind of use this space as a to get feedback from people um, who are also, it sounds like uh, at least a few other people are also interested in going through a similar process um so yeah that i guess a bit of a comment um that yeah i think those would be great like next steps almost is like trying to model those systems that you guys both just mentioned yeah i think that'd be great i i know for me personally like a lot of these don't really fall in place until i can apply them and i was telling peter this earlier but uh for me i gotta have examples of them actually being used and just one example is not usually good enough because i really focus in on like trying to understand the boundaries and the, uh, particular relationships with concepts and you can't do that without just data i have to be able to see example after example so that i can start to define the relationships more completely um so i'm all for taking some of these um crypto economic these token mechanics and starting to break them down um but just to reiterate something i said earlier we are now venturing into a place where i don't have a lot of experience so this is going to need to be opened up more uh as like a discussion and less like a lecture Mm -hmm. 
but I'm all for it. These are these are things that'll help me too. So yeah, and and also to that point, we so we do have um, other people with that have expertise or actual experience in like token economic systems. I think Tyler mentioned this too. Um, that'll be joining the program too in the next few weeks. Um, so yeah, like we've said, it's kind of a combination of us going through this process together, plus getting support from other people. Um, so I feel like we're like kind of getting into that next phase of uh, now, <laughs> yeah, more um, more group learning and stuff. But uh, yes, yeah, so I just want to make sure that everybody understands the concepts. If everyone understands the concepts that we went over today in this in the crash course, uh, these four you know dimensions, spaces, blocks, and points. If people understand that, then I feel like we're ready to move on to taking real systems and breaking them down and trying to map it to systems. But I, but you know, I, I thought that we were there last week and then I got off the call and realized that I lost a lot of people in weeds. I want to make sure that when we get off this call today, there's nobody that is unsure of what a block is or how points get fed into a block and come out of a block. Like those, at least from a high level, these concepts need to be clear. And then I think we can start jumping into breaking systems down. So that's kind of my objective for today. I, I want to make sure you guys really understand these concepts and then, yeah, let's start breaking down system. Cool. Yeah, and uh, Quiet Catalyst, I, um, I'm also super interested in the bonding curve topic. And Jeff uh, Emmett, I know, is definitely interested in that. He always talks about modeling bonding curves. <laughs> uh, he was here earlier. It looks like he dropped out now, but... I'm sure like he would yeah. be awesome to collaborate on that, whether it's in this group or if you guys connect outside and bring the progress into the group too. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I read some of Jeff's stuff. Um, oh, right, and, right. I remember you saying that. Yeah, th th there's a lot out there on bonding curves. So mm -hmm. if we could have some expert guidance in terms of where to start, I mean, maybe you start with like a straight line bonding curve or, or maybe even start before that and think about what's governing the circulating supply of tokens mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. I, I don't i personally don't know um where to start exactly um hmm. but i think that's good <laughs> maybe maybe you take that for the next week just try and like think of it yourself jeff should be back too um next week and maybe you guys can um we can reserve some time next week for talking about that topic. If if you guys want to post in the um, CAD CAD study group, not the the voice, but the text channel, if you guys want to post ideas or or uh, systems that you're interested in potentially modeling, um, drop them in there, and I'll compile a list, and uh, and we can start exploring these systems together. Um, that way, everybody gets something that they're interested in, but it also gives everybody a chance to experiment with something different than what, you know, they they normally would would um, mm -hmm. model, and hopefully through all of those different systems being explored together as a group, people really flesh out their understanding of not just the concepts and how they relate to each other, but how to sort of think about systems and breaking them down um, into more logical units. Cool. Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah. So we, we yeah. know that bonding curves, for example, is, is going to be a popular one. I, I assume uh, that most of the ideas will be around token engineering, but don't limit it to that. If, if, there, if there's a system you're interested in that's not strictly token engineering related, uh, that's OK. Go ahead and drop it there. It's all going to be used as example uh, and, ex and experience for us. So yeah, yeah just drop your ideas. Yeah, and, and Tyler mentioned earlier today that um, even uh, Zargum says that modeling these systems or mapping them out is an art. It's like not something that there's exact instructions for. And the yeah. only way to get better at that is by actually doing it or doing it on multiple, um, you know, multiple different systems, seeing other people's methods, all of that stuff. So I think that's a cool example of like why we want to have a couple different ideas, um, whether it's a bonding curve from a token uh, context or if it's like yeah. predator prey or something, and then you get two examples of how to do it. Um, 
yeah cool does anybody actually have um experience with modeling or like the block diagrams causal loop diagrams um anyone like with much extensive experience in in those topics I've done a little bit of it. I helped up with the theory masterclass and some of those drawings, but oh, cool. no ninja. Okay. Um, nice. Yeah. yeah. So, go ahead. I, I think next week I'll I'll try to come with a little bit more concrete information around those particular those at least the three big diagramming, um, you know, tools or whatever. And maybe I can I can help people start you know breaking their own models down into one of those three or, or actually several I've, I've seen the block science guys do this before where they'll do a causal loop and then somebody else will do a block diagram and it, it kind of describes the same perspective and i think that doing it a couple different ways again just sheds light and helps you better fully understand the system that that you're intending to model mm -hmm. um but i i can brush up on those and get some resources um, put together for next week and then you know if we've got a, a list of models that people want to explore come prepared to just start breaking them down and uh and we'll do it together i think that that would be really really useful yeah and if you don't have a model yet um that is can also totally be like a next step for you is to just think like i don't know over the next seven days look outside and find a model <laughs> or right, right. um yeah, think about one like in your apartment or in your house. <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, it could literally be be anything um, and make that as your learning goal. Or if you don't want to model and you want to like, I don't know, write uh, or do more research, in-depth research on generalized dynamical systems, like you're, you're also free to do that. We like, we don't want to limit the topics of this group to like, picking a model and defining it with the CAD CAD 1.0 concepts too. Um, so if you don't feel like that's something you're interested in, um, you could also go another direction, but that's up to you. Um, but I think it sounds like that's where a few people will be headed um, in the group. Cool. Um, then on this topic, I do have um, actually in the one-stop shop, I could um, show one thing that we set up before the course was running. Let me just find it. I'm actually going to share my screen. Um, okay, yeah. Stop this. Just right. in case, in case it's helpful. So, okay. Oh, where's my screen? Oh. That's not what I meant to share. <laughs> um, oh, geez, I've got a lot of monitors going on here. CAD, CAD, study group. OK, there it is, one-stop shop. Um, and all right, I think everybody can see it now. Okay, so this is the one-stop shop if you haven't pulled it up yet. Um, and we have resources that we've been linking. I took some session notes today. Um, so those are just two quick comments. But um, so this, we, we, before we actually started the program, we like created some infrastructure that might be helpful. Um, we just created this space for people to put their learning goals and uh, this is basically what we were just talking about of like picking systems that um, you're interested in modeling. So you could throw it in Discord and, you know, keep your notes on your own um, in your own space and, and just kind of do your own thing and, and share progress with the group. Or if you want to do it in uh, in public or like share a space for it, um, you could use this too and just kind of duplicate. So we have a, a, a template <laughs> for... Um, creating your learning, your learning, documenting your learning journey, um, you know, deciding what is your learning goal for this study group, thinking about how you'll want to use CAD CAD for that. Um, and you could say like, 
modeling uh, modeling um, rock, paper, scissors. Um, game. I mean, yeah, so that could be, for example, what Tyler would have put. Um, and then if you want, this might be actually a helpful exercise to just think about like what steps you'll take um, and where you'll start. So um, yeah, like stop diagrams or whatever you want to do, um, just kind of creating your own um, journey. So in case you have no idea what to do or where to start, maybe this template would be helpful. Um, or if you already have ideas, then you can certainly use that too. But we wanted to use this as an option. Um, yeah, one one thing I would just like to add too, as you guys are coming up with ideas for that you would, uh, you would like to see modeled, um, be thinking about specifics too. Like, um, you know, just, just using one of the most recent examples, the Olympus DAO. That's a great thing to model, but there's a lot that could be modeled there. So is there something in particular that we're interested in exploring? Or is it just like, you know, sort of a more high level holistic view of the DAO in general um, and some of the properties therein? Or, is, you know, let's let's try and think if, if there's a particular system that you are particularly interested in and there's a certain facet about that system that you're interested in make sure that you you've identified that as well and next week start exploring them we can make sure that we're doing it from that angle that you know gives you some useful information we're not just doing it for the sake of exploring i think if if we're going to be exploring this stuff together it should be it should be applicable it should be useful it should be interesting i don't want to do it just for the sake of you know doing it i want it to be applicable so be thinking about cool. that awesome any comments on that stuff, like anything that's like, doesn't, wasn't helpful or your would be helpful to clear up or anything. Excuse me, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there a repo or a link where one can have um, different kind of systems? Um, probably that is related to a DAO or the DAO or any system where one can just go and probably pick one um, to rather than thinking or whatever that is learned from that one could actually be transferred into whatever concept or challenge that one is trying to solve. I just want to know because at the moment I don't have any. Maybe when I think over it, I can get some, but just trying to find out if there's a repo where you could have likely questions that one can interact with. Um, so you're, sorry, I couldn't totally grab the question. So it's, you're wondering about question or um, like different examples of systems that one might look into? Is that? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, if we could aggregate them and put them into a spot, you yeah, know, I think I think that's kind of what we're getting at. Rather than just having them in the Discord chat, I've got them in a text document here, but we could definitely post them. Cool. And yeah. then uh, and work through that list together. Yeah, definitely. Um, we can find a spot a space to do that. Um, I also was, I'm sure there's like. Ah, I know. So the the old CAD CAD documentation um, actually had some good examples of like robots and marbles and a few other um, like onboarding level systems that might be helpful to start with. So, or at least just to like get your mind thinking about like what a system, what system you could um, choose if that's what you're, where you want to take this. Um, so I can send that in the um, Discord too. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, anything else? I think we'll probably wrap up early because um, we don't have more content, but we also want to make sure that everybody, uh, yeah, feels like they're in a good spot, understands um, points, dimensions, spaces, blocks. Um, yeah, any, any comments or questions? 
Yeah, one last one. So yeah. if we wanted to uh, just kind of play around, is the block impulse uh, like a uh, look ahead? I noticed the RPS refers to cadcat.dynamics, um, which is like in that particular branch. Um, um sorry, I, I might have missed that. The block, which which repo were you referring to? Uh, to the um, cadcat ri um, mm -hmm. repo. There's the block impulse branch. Um, is that a place to tinker with dynamics as they evolve? Uh, yeah. Until it gets merged into main, though, we're not treating it. As law. So you feel free to go ahead and play with those branches that we're working on. But like I said, in, until it gets merged into main, just understand that a lot of that is experimental. That branch in particular is exploring one of like two or three different concepts that we have um, for some stuff that we're doing. Um, and so there's a very good chance that none of that, as it's currently implemented in that branch, will end up being merged in. I would say your safest bet is just exploring main. Um, and we, we should have updates almost weekly um, to, to main. We're, we're trying to get stuff merged in on a, on a regular. So I guess it just really <laughs> depends on your, uh, your risk aversion, right? If you don't want to bother yeah. learning something that might not stick around, I would say just st stick with main. You're still going to have some stuff that gets merged into main that we end up reverting or go or changing, but that will happen much less often on that branch. Cool. Awesome. Cool, cool. Um... Sweet. I see we've already got a number of model ideas in the Discord. And yeah, I mean, if you don't have a model idea too, you could jump on um, with someone else or, I mean, just copy their idea and do it do it on your own or see if they want to work together on it or whatever. Um, that's all cool too. Sweet. Any other questions? Otherwise, I think we can wrap up. All right, then um, do well. Quick, quick question for for everyone: Is it helpful to send the calendar invites on Google Calendar, or is it okay to just tag you all in Discord for reminders? Or um, do you have the calendar set up yourself already? There was a question, sorry. Um, just wondering if it would be helpful to send out calendar invites for next week again. I was planning on wrapping it up, but it would be, yes? It's useful for me. Yeah. I, I do everything out of my calendar, so. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right, I'll yeah, stick with it. It's useful for me, too. Thanks, awesome. everybody. Appreciate it. Appreciate you all having me. Thanks, guys. Yeah. See you next week. All right, everyone. Thanks, See ya. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.